Hello and welcome to episode 82 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings, and 10 years ago I gave up my live streaming career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician, Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. In this episode, I'm joined by one of the greatest soul music talents the UK has produced in the last 35 years. My guest is Omar Lifouk, MBE. Considered a musical prodigy as a kid, he's a true original with an unforgettable voice. We hear about his musical DNA, joining the Star Council on tour in 1989 and working on his upcoming new LP with Paul Weller. He's an outstanding musician and a huge songwriting talent, so you're going to love this one. Let's get into it. Omar, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. I'm so looking forward to chatting to you, I have to say, not least because of your amazing career, but also there are some really recent links to Paul Weller that I can't wait to get into because there's not an awful lot of information out there aside from the odd Instagram <laughs> post from yourself. So this could be an right. improper exclusive. We'll see how much I can extract from that. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, now, first of all, let's go back to the beginning. Obviously, this is a Paul Weller fan podcast, so we'll kick off with that. But when was it you first became aware of the music of Mr. Weller? Uh, it would definitely be the jam because I would have been in primary school, I think. I think when I would have first heard, you know, that's entertainment and you know all songs, yeah, all the all the hit eat and rifles, all that kind of stuff. That was the first time I was aware of him. But uh, to actually get to work with him was when I was 18, I believe. And he was uh, about to go on tour in Japan. And his bass player, Camille Hines, was doing some kind of seminar or something. And then I did my uh, beatbox a cappella thing. He said, oh, Paul would love to hear that. And I went and sort of like did it for him. He said, yeah, yeah, come on, come on tour. And, uh, so we, we <laughs> I didn't know about tour. the beatboxing. So was this something yeah. you'd done for a long time? I mean, there's, there's pretty much every single instrument you can play. And we'll talk about that in a sec. But I didn't know yeah. about the beatboxing. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say beatbox. It was more per capella. A per capella is, is what they call it. I got it from Bobby McFerrin, basically. Okay. There was a, used to be a, a chocolate ad, which I used to I used to mimic that. And then from that, I made up my own thing as well. But it's totally, you know, it's totally influenced by him. And yeah, that was the thing I showcased for him. And then, uh, yeah, we went on tour of Japan in 1989 with the Star Council. I was playing percussion and doing vocals as well, which ended up at the Royal Albert Hall. Exciting. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a because that was towards the end of the Style Council and a and quite controversial gig at the Royal Albert Hall. We'll talk about that in a sec. So let's talk about musical talent because musical talent really runs deep in, in your DNA, doesn't it? I mean, in terms of your family tree, my God, there's, mm. there's, there's a wealth of talent there, isn't there? My grandfather plays uh, sax on my mother's side and my dad is a drummer. He played with the Doris Troy, uh, Horace Andy, Marty and Griffiths, uh, people like that. He started his own record label for his band called Jai Lion, which is a reggae band as well. And then had my brothers on there with a band called Burning Bush, which is a lot like a musical youth. So I was saying my sister's a singer. My brother is a, a, a Grammy Award winning uh, producer as well with, with uh, the Marley Boys as well. So yeah, it's it's all been there around and you, us. And this thing for you kicks off at like a really young age, didn't it? I mean, the first single you were like, what, 16? But before that 16. you were, I mean, you can play every instrument under the sun, can't you? No, 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 no. I used to, I used to play, I used to have a go at everything that I, that, you know, somebody put in my hand. So I would have a crack at it. So I played, you know, I started off playing the, the cornet and then went to the euphonium, then the baritone euphonium, then the tuba. And in the meantime, I was playing the guitar, I was playing the piano, I was playing drums. In fact, I started on drums and then I ended up playing percussion in a youth orchestra, playing tuba in a, in a, a brass quintet, playing percussion in a percussion ensemble. I studied at Cheatham School of Music as well before going on to the Guild Hall as well. So yeah, I've just, I, I've had a crack at everything. But now I just say it's bass, drums and keys. I read something that at one point you didn't like your voice at all. You, you didn't consider yourself a great... <laughs> yeah, I, 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 there's certain times I don't... I, I don't like it right now. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm a, I, I'll have a crack at something. I'm a vibes man, is what I always tell people. I'm not saying I'm the world's greatest singer or anything like that. I know I have my tone and I know I have my place in, you know, and things like that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't put myself up against other singers. That's just, that's just suicide. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I just stick to the, the very uh, safe narrative is that I'm the vibes man. I'm very good at that. Very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about, you mentioned the Style Council and going to Japan. So at that point, you'd only had one single out as a very young man, Mr. Postman, but Paul didn't yeah. bring you on. It wasn't like your big smash hit single or anything like that. It was, so what were you on board to do exactly? No, it was previous to that actually, uh, before the, uh, there's something like this. And I'd had, what's this, eight, 89. So I would have had three or four singles out because I had five singles out before there's nothing like this. 
Prince. So I had a little bit of a track record. But um, yeah, because I did the, the, the percussion thing and then I told them that I played percussion, that's what they brought me on board to. And plus I was singing too. So it was percussion and singing. And it was uh, that was my first professional gig. And it was such a joy, you know, because you got your own percussion tech. So you don't have to set anything up. You just got somebody there that's doing that for you. Nice two week, we paid a rehearsal thing, you know, nice trip to Japan, which was my first time as well. So it was um, uh, a lot of benefits. So I've got a lot to, I've uh, got a lot to owe to Paul for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and an amazing lineup, really. You th- I mean, a really interesting one because this Paul was mm. really into house music at the time. So this wasn't like they were touring a greatest hits album. There were none of the songs you'd really know and love, were it there? It was two, two hours of music that nobody knew what it was. Could kind of see it on the, audience's face like they were like all excited and all of a sudden they're kind of well, what, what's this <laughs> sort of thing. but that was the period that was the period that he was going through you know um he likes to experiment people like i say i mean jacko peak who's back in the band now uh, was on tour we do there marco nelson dr yes. robert was part of the band yeah. playing bass and yeah. and other things and kamel hines but there's this bit i've seen the set list and there's a bit where halfway through all it says is omar song and it doesn't. I, <laughs> so I'm like, what was the I think, song? <laughs> I think that is the the uh, the you know my acapella thing. Oh, is that that's you? What I did. <laughs> I think I, I think that's what it is. I mean, geez, this is 30, 33 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so the memory banks aren't that full uh, again. But I think that's that's what it would have been. You know, so that was so little. that was so. What is this? So, so, so talk me through how, what this is then. So you're banging your chest. You're... So you just bang your chest. You're down, 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 down. And people go crazy for that shit. So uh, <laughs> I, I just, I did a couple of songs um, doing it, but it's totally Bobby McFerrin influence. I would never take the credit for that. And even there's a little bit of Biz Marquee at, at the end with that. As well, when you tap the throat, so yeah, just a little show showstopper. <laughs> love it, love it. That's brilliant. Okay, so then, um, and then very soon after, your first album comes out, which contains the track, the song that that changed everything. There's nothing like this you mentioned earlier. I mean, did you know that was something special from day one? Uh, yeah, no, not to be big headed about it, but yes, I did uh, because what I used to do back then, I made a cassette of this when I demoed the song. I made a one sided cassette. Boys and girls, you, you have to Google that now, don't you? Um, for, so it's 45 minutes of the same song, just repeated over and over again. I was like, kind of, this sounds all right. And then I played it to my dad and the record label guy it was like, listening to this song over and over again. Didn't get bored of it. And just kind of like, this. I think this is the one. And it was like the last song as well, because I'd been releasing singles up until that point. And then my dad was like, no, I think we need to make an album because we've got enough tracks. We should do that. But we didn't really have like a, the clincher. And then that was the last song that I wrote. From the demo, it made an impression. And then from then, you know, the rest is history. I mean, he went to number 54 without any video, without any TV, without any uh, promotional campaign, as it were. It was purely the, the pirate stations and clubs and, you know, all the clubs playing it, basically. So uh, I knew, knew it was going to be something big. And initially it was released in your dad's label, but then Talking Loud yeah. picked it up. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. The year after, because it was 1990s on my dad's label. And Giles and Norman Jay came out of me when my dad said that that's the kind of thing that Talking Loud was doing. So I was on the stable with, you know, Young, young Disciples, Galliano, Incognito. We all thought alike. You know, we liked our, 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 our old school soul music, but we were trying to recreate that vibe, basically. And I think that's where they came up with the term acid jazz from, which now they call it neo, neo soul or neo classic soul. And we'll talk about genres actually, because I, th- I see often that people try to pigeonhole you as a you know a soul singer or neo soul and things. But it seems to me, you, I mean, there's classical in some of your music. It, you cross so many different boundaries, and I think that's re- that was really exciting. So we'll talk about that in a sec. But it, it's interesting talking about like, you mentioned Galliano. So Mick Talbot, the Style Council, was in Galliano, wasn't he? And then, that's right. Uh, that's right. And he's yeah, in the style. Yeah. yeah. And then Young Disciples, um, Carly Anderson, who went on to work with Paul and yourself. There's a beautiful and Marco duet. Nelson. Yeah, Marco Nelson. So there's all these little connections. But there's also another connection uh, of Bert Bevan. So, am I right in thinking Bert Bevan's mixed the album? Is that right? Bert Bevan's. Hold on. Did, did, did you not know mix your album? Pro, pro, possibly. He, he might have. Yeah, that's really gone back into the ether. That is. Uh, <laughs> was I there? I can't remember. I remember mixing the first one. Maybe it was Bert Bevan's. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. He, and he went on to like remix Long Hot Summer, or he had before that Long Hot Summer and Money Go Round and, and Soul Deep oh, right. and, and built the original Ministry of Sound Club in London as well. So I thought there was a little connection there. That oh, wow. Well, that, that is a big connection. Yeah. Yeah. But actually on the follow-up album, some music comes out a couple of years later, which is you mm. really maturing as a composer, 
an arranger, a vocalist, even though, like you say, you're not sure, but, but the rest of us are, <laughs> thank goodness. Yeah. But there's this lovely duet with you and Carleen Anderson, who again is working with Paul at that time as well. So were you aware of these Weller connections happening with these people you were working with or not really? Yeah, we, we were all kind of like, you know, we all hung out together. We, you know, it was that kind of vibe at the time. I mean, that was written between myself, Carleen and Max Beasley, who played with Weller as well. Weller, and he was playing with Jamiroquai uh, Incognito at the same time. So we all kind of hung out together. You know what I mean? Or we were in the same place. I remember I used to get drum lessons when I was seven years old. And I remember it was in a in a rehearsal room for a band. And I could always remember the smell of fried eggs. I think to this day, this is why I love fried eggs. But um, <laughs> so, I, but, and it turned out to be underneath a calf. And then it turned out to be Incognito's rehearsal room as well. So, you know what I mean? It's a small world. I wouldn't want to paint it, but it is a small world. Oh, that's lovely. I love the fact that you all hang out because, yeah, you, Max obviously now is a huge Hollywood actor, but was part of the yeah. Paul Weller movement. And, and he works with you on quite a few of your albums, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He's played um, percussion and, and, and I've, done, I've done stuff for him. And he's incidentally on this latest one too because he was over here for a, a brief period um, doing a show. So while he was there, I, I went to Weller's um, Black Barn studio and laid down a few tracks and he's come on and played drums, percussion, and that is his particular flavour to it. Nice, so yeah, nice. to this day, we're, we're still working together. together. Nice, nice. Well, we should talk about this because um, I saw this on your Instagram, your ninth studio album, and there are other mm. albums with other people as well and kind of things around this as well, but your ninth solo yeah. studio album, and there you were at Black Barn, and I think as far back as, was it was it April last year? Or maybe a bit before that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know better than me. <laughs> I'm basically stalking you. But there was this yeah. wonderful post where we were like, "We're working on music that's going to make you want to buy a Parker and a Vespa." <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Yeah, there's uh, there's one particular tune uh, that basically he sent me the chords to this thing, and straight away I had it in my head what the beat was supposed to be, and and then I sent the I I, I basically played to a record company guy I know Greg Borman and that's that's his quote basically he goes I want to buy a Parker and a, and a Vespa <laughs> because it just takes you back because I just want to kind of to kind of recreate that that vibe I mean it's not exactly jam it's not you know it's not style council but it's definitely well up the way we fit on it together is perfect as well so I can't see anything other than a, than a hit out of that I've got to say love it sure. love it and is it the whole Can album I, is being made at Black Barn Studios or bits no, well I, I did I have recorded and mixed quite a bit of it there yeah I mean he's done me such a solid let me use this I mean that's his personal studio you know what I mean and that's uh, you know more grateful I couldn't be to do it there uh, it's not all completely because I've got my own studio in South London called Backyard Studio in, in Fort Eve. I did a, a large majority of the, the mix in there and I'm just about to finish off the last couple of tracks. But um, yeah, it's definitely got that black barn edge to it. Okay, okay. Well, we'll come back to that because there are, I mean, a list of people that you've worked with, are kind of, you know, people queuing up to work with you. People mm. like, you know, Karen Wheeler, again, there's another Weller connection there with the Jabak and the Jam, I think. Um, Erica Badu, the late, great Leon Ware. Uh, Stevie Wonder, mm. there's this wonderful quote, Stevie Wonder saying, when I grow up, I want to be like Omar, which I love. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you clearly love working and bouncing off other people and collaborating. I can be quite insular and do. I mean, you know, there's nothing better than working by myself. But then there's also nothing better than like bouncing off of other people as well to get that vibe. It's like working, you know, having a band. I think, and and I mean a band in the traditional sense. I'm sure we're talking the same way. I fucking hate it when they talk about boy bands. Yeah, you know, and this manufactured pop thing, which is not a band. A band is a group of guys that play together, play, sing, eat, sleep, shit together. You know what I mean? That, that's a band. And yeah, you know, I just know the right time to when I, when I need to bounce off someone or if I just need to do this myself. You know what I mean? Because I can get more work done that way as well. I mean, you know, I work a lot with my brother, but we have our we have brother temperaments. You know what I mean? So one more, it's all love, and the next minute I, I want to rip his head off. But it all goes in. It, but it all goes into the music. You know what I mean? That's that, that's all. That's what music's for. It's about expressing yourself. So when you get these situations, you, you should yeah. um, use them. And how do you approach making an album? Making a new album? What comes first? I don't even think about that. It's an album. I mean, this stuff. It's always ongoing. You're always making stuff. Uh, like stuff I've, I've done with my brother. With the last album, the first track on the album is called Vicky's Tune. Oh, man. When I mentioned about a genre, that you, like your classical roots really come through beautifully on that track. Is that Was that coming out of you or your brother, a bit of, bit of both of you? No, that, that track is all me. That is all me. Uh, why it's called Vicky Tune? Because... So she's the mother of my girls. And I remember playing her the, the, in the bare bones idea of track. She was like, oh, she really loved that. I mean, you know, everything just comes into that track um, in that way. But 
Well, I started writing that in 2003. Didn't use it until 2017. And that's how a lot of the tracks work. Because I think it's like a, a puzzle that you have to put together or you're telling a story. So I used to have a beginning, middle, and end. And it's like a, a, an arc where everything, you know, you, everything makes sense. So it's like, you know, that track goes there and that one goes there. And, you know, you start putting the things together. And then by the time you finish, you've got an album, basically. So like this album, which is n- number nine, there's tracks on there which I started 2007, 2008 as well. Just, they're just waiting for the right time to be used. You know, it's like you get, you get some wine as well. You stick it in the cellar and you leave it until it's the right time to drink it. That's how I look at it. Nice. And where are, are these all in, just in your head? Have you got a notebook that you're writing stuff down? Are they in the computer on a hard drive that you hope doesn't crash? How's it working? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, the various forms. I mean, I have the audio note on... You've oh. got an iPhone? Yeah, yeah, on your iPhone. Yeah, yeah. so a, a lot of the time, if I've got that idea and I just don't want to lose it, I stick it down and put it there, you know what I mean? And make sure I've captured it because a lot of the time, if you don't capture it, then it's gone, <laughs> gone into the air. So that's the that's the kind of the basic way I work. And have you ever fallen out of love with the music? Because you took a break from music for a little bit, but I think that was more to drive the acting side of your career. Never taking a break. Never no. taking a break. No. Just go, I mean, one, one album took me seven years to finish, basically. But but I had to be touring. You know, I had bills to pay as well. <laughs> and you no, know, not every time you know, when you, you're creating it, it's, it's going to come out. So incidentally, with the acting. Thing. I've just got a couple of parts actually. Um, one's on an ITV drama, but anyway, Brilliant. Um, right. yeah, you know, it's all it's always ongoing. You know, it's it's funny. Yeah, when people don't see it, they think, ah, oh, nothing's happening. But I'm just working all the time. You know what I mean? And keeping it going, especially with the lockdowns and everything that happened. I lost a lot of shows after that. I I, I was supposed to tour Brazil, I was supposed to tour America, Italy, France, Germany, Greece. All just went up in flames. So I had to think of another way of uh, occupying myself. And not going crazy. So I bought a couple of GoPro cameras, stuck them in the studio, some some, some, some lights, and then started doing live streams. And that seemed to resonate with people and saying that, you know, it was kind of a way for them to like, lose themselves by just watching what I was doing as well. So, you know, that was, um, yeah, that was therapeutic for me too. Yeah, I remember reading um, Steve Craddock saying when he, when he heard about the first lockdown and the first person he thought about was Paul Weller. Um, Christ, what's he going to do? Because he was, he's been out on the road for like 30 years, 40 years or whatever. <laughs> and I think the similar, yeah. you've always been touring, haven't you? You've always been performing. Always been touring and always performing. But I think uh, Weller was fine. I mean, he's, <laughs> if you see Black Barn, you, you, you know that that's, I'd be happy to hang out there for the friggin' two years. You know what I mean? And that's, that's the studio. And you know what I mean? That's the, that's the studio. So yeah, it's, it's how people dealt with it, basically. And it was been very hard for a lot of people to get through. And I've just been blessed. And I always do this, give thanks. Whoever's controlling this shit, because it's not me, but there's somebody out there is looking out for me. And, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for that. I read somewhere that you'd said the best bit of advice you'd ever had came from Paul Weller. <laughs> I can't tell you what that is. <laughs> I really cannot tell you what that is. Not even off the record. I can can't you, let that one out. Can you tell me when it was? Roughly, this would have been. Yeah, this is a while ago. So maybe where 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 are we now? Twenty two. This is before the girls. Maybe twenty years ago. Maybe twenty five years ago. It, okay. It's a while back. But um, <laughs> I'm stuck to that. Where did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I see. I, I wondered if it was because you've both got twins. So I thought it might have been more recently. And no, no, no. That. Although his came later than yours, I think, didn't he? But yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. No, <laughs> no idea, no idea. Much as much as I'm going to say. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, yeah. We should yeah. also talk about um, your MBE as well, because, I mean, sure. Christ, that's that's pretty exciting. So this is um, 10 years ago now. Yeah, yeah. 20, oh, yeah, it is. 20, 10 years ago, got a letter from you know, the prime minister saying I wanted if you you know you want to accept this award. And I was like, hell yeah, because I don't really get any war. You know, you don't see me. You don't see me the Brits or the Mercury's or anything like that. You know, so to get some kind of award for for my efforts is uh, quite a big thing. I've just recently got a fellowship as well from my, my old college. Oh, amazing! Um, yeah, so I got some more letters after my name. So, uh, <laughs> so what's the full letters now? What are the full letters? <laughs> so it says M B E F G S, oh. fellow of the. Guildhall School. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of those. It's nice to be recognised for what you're doing. It's not, I'm just doing this as a hobby. <laughs> it's, it's a nice thing. I know it's quite controversial. It's not like they say, not everybody does 
deserves it. But fuck it, I'm taking my, I'm taking my <laughs> flowers. <laughs> yeah. And who, who did you get it from? Was it the Queen or was it Charlie? Or? It was supposed to be the Queen, but it was Charles. Yeah, he said, uh, are you still making music? I went, no, yeah. He goes, well, do drop off a copy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I went, okay, and I did. And he and I got a letter back saying, Prince Charles, uh, thanks you for his copy. And he said, I'll listen to it. It's, earliest convenience. I don't know if you've listened to it yet or not. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Okay. Well, yeah, let's talk about the latest album because there were a couple of clips I saw on Instagram where you were there at Black Barn, the sign's up, Weller's Town. We get a glimpse into the studio and there's your brother there. Yeah, your brother is so talented, this turntable wizard known as Scratch Professor. <laughs> My God, he's good at that, isn't he? He's prolific. Yeah, he's uh, he's been doing it a long time I mean he, he'll he'll write he'll make a beat and do a tune and then he'll remix that four or five times even before anybody's on it I mean he just remixed pretty much an album of common acapellas that you can get off of YouTube and he's put beats to them and they sound wicked you know so he, he's constantly coming up with the content and uh, yeah you know, I, I owe a lot of a lot of my content to, to him basically yeah. because he's just ty- he's just tireless and what role basically. is he playing on the album down at Blackburn what are you work? is he pushing you driving you forward is he a producer is he a musician a bit about yeah he's uh, well basically there's, a, there's about three or four tunes there's not as many as the last album but there's three or four tunes that are, are, I want to use for this one so I just had him come down and soak up the vibe because you know this we're still working on songs and it's a work in progress but it's good that if we're hanging out together that was a beauty of that, that barn is that you get, you get to stay there as well um, that's, and that's how I used to work back in the day when I did uh, music I was at uh, Studio in Farnham uh, okay. not the real world but yeah it was, a, it was a residential studio and there's nothing better than just like cutting off the, the outside world and all you do is eat sleep music you know what I mean get up and and you know your meals are taken care of for you and everything you don't have to worry about it you just get into that into that zone and you get on with it and Black Barn gave me that memory of that basically so I can continue this evolution of my music that I've uh, I've been working on so far yeah and so did uh, you have one of the famous Ripley Curry Garden Curries I did (laughs) (laughs) we we did in fact yeah because that it was kind of a a nice reunion thing as well because I had the brass guys come down and the uh, there's the brass uh Jerry Meehan who plays bass for Robbie Williams we uh, me him and Max all went to school together you know what I mean so it was like we had a couple of days and it was just a, a big piss up and food and curries and stuff as well so it was really a nice little event um, basically everything was centred around and of course you got to top it off with a carry <laughs> uh, it's nice so there's this one track with Paul that he's involved in or no involved? we've got we have three songs together as well so but there's there's one that's, that's the standout track so I'm just working out how how I put everything out there basically because I want to know why I need I'm trying to work out a plan of action because I know I, I know of a pressing plant where I can get uh, vinyls made because I know vinyls are getting quite big now so I wouldn't mind doing some vinyl releases first before I come out with the album so people get a taste of what's coming so and you know that's a big deal working with Weller I've also been talking to Common Q-Tip India, Ari as well. They're all interested in, in getting on the album as well. So I just got to work out strategies and working out, you know, just uh, getting the things done and getting it out to the people. Because, yeah, I've been teasing them long enough. Everybody's like, when's the album not coming? <laughs> How much can you tell us about the songs with Paul? So can you tell us any titles? Can you tell us, talk about that collaborative process in terms of how you worked on them together? Okay, well, the, 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 the standout track is called On My Own. And what first kicked it off was... Paul sending me a voice note in playing piano and singing a song. And I was like, straight away, I knew the groove that I wanted and I gave him a reference for that and he loved that. And then I knew the drummer I wanted, which was Daru Jones. He played drums for Jack White, playing with Ferro Munch at the moment. But his style is perfect for that song. And then I was like, oh, I need horns. I absolutely need a horn section. So we got a five-piece horn section, which all my mates from college and past benches as well. And it's just a, a back and forth, basically. And... That's basically what it's been. It's funny because he's he's a late night worker. It's like, oh, you, you know, you, you'll always get a, a text at like half past midnight, one o'clock. So he's obviously up. That's his time when he's like, you know, mossy with 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 ideas. But yeah, it's forever doing this. And, and I'm just one of the things that he's working on. You know what I mean? So I can't imagine what, you know, like what it is. I mean, he's got his big note board to show what he's doing from day to day. I mean, just to keep everything in check, but um, very easy to work with. And it, it's surprising that we haven't done this until now for as long as we've known each other. But he just popped into my mind a few years back. And a friend of mine said she wanted to go and see a concert. And then from then, you know, I contacted Max. Max 
contacted them and then he contacted me back. He said, yeah, come to the show. It was a big thing in the South Bank. And then from them, he said, we should just do something. He, yeah, he goes, yeah, man, no problem. And then, you know, that's when we met at Black Barn and uh, nice. the rest, as they say, is history. Would that have been the gigs with the orchestra? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, the Royal Festival Hall. I yeah, think. I was there. I remember. And I read something about the fact that one of your ambitions is to perform a full concert with an orchestra as well. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you noticed the other stuff I've done on the, the Insta. I've just... Uh, Recently got Chris Cameron, who did the arrangements for Last Request, uh, Who Chooses the Seasons, to do arrangements for two songs on this this album as well. And you can't, I mean, I was crying. I was literally crying. When you hear the string section, there's something about the tone that vibrates with it. And it also takes me back to school as well. And when I used to play in the youth orchestra, I was a principal percussionist of the Kent Youth Orchestra. We used to do courses. We played at the Royal Festival every year as well. And it's something about being backstage and you hear those strings. You're kind of like, you know, it's coming, yeah, the course is coming to an end. But the sound of the, the pieces, Brahms, Mahler, uh, Debussy, uh, Borjak, whoever, it's something that, you know, you can't replace. I mean, you can do a cheap version and then maybe get a quartet to do it and play it over and over again. But if you get the whole section, you know, like that. And this, I'm, I'm really gutted because I was supposed to do a thing for Trevor Nelson at Albert Hall two weeks ago, just before Christmas. And it would have been with a 60 piece. It would have been with the oh. BBC Concert Orchestra, which is a 60 piece orchestra. You know what I mean? I, I would have been, I don't know if I could have seen it, I'd just be crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you saw, because Paul, Paul did the yeah. um, concert, the Barbican, didn't he? With, um, just around the corner from your old stomping ground in terms of the, right. the, the college. Right, that's it, um, the, and that was with the full BBC Symphony Orchestra, wasn't it? So yeah, we've got Amazing. to see, we've got to see you in that. Uh, that's got to be a thing, my friend. It's going to happen. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to manifest it. So, yeah. yeah, watch this space. Now, I have to talk to you as well about the anthology. So this came at the beginning of 2020. I think we finally got vinyl of it. You mentioned vinyl and how long that takes. Yeah. We got vinyl tailing it last year, wasn't it? Um, but this is a Sold double, out. Yeah, it's sold it's out. Sold I was going to say, yeah. sold out instantly. But a double yeah. album best of. I mean, from all of your back catalogue, how the heck do you approach creating a, a, like a, a, an album? Hell, I have no idea. I mean, it's, I started with 50 songs and then I had to cut that down to 30 something to fit the CDs. And then when it was a, the vinyl, I had to cut it down. And again and you know I kind of put it out to the public help oh, tell me what you would want on it and they were like just make a triple album make a quadruple album I'm like yeah that's not an option <laughs> you know what I mean so I, I just had to I just had to be ruthless and go bam and then not even think about it because I saw people saying oh yeah I hope this one's on there I hope that's on there and I'm like well I'm not listen you know what I mean? it's, it's not on there so just deal with it I mean you can hear the tracks anyway but uh, you know the vinyl purist would want certain songs on there so it wasn't easy but yeah Fuck it, yeah. I had to be done. What was the reason for doing that? Was that like a like a pause and a kind of reflective moment because of lockdown, or oh no, it came before? That. <laughs> no, so no, was, yeah. sim- no, simply because of uh, the vinyl turnaround. Right at the moment, is I mean, I heard the story was it's because Adele um, <laughs> bought out all, all the uh, uh, vinyl yeah, yeah. press implants and she had to print up a million uh, copies, and nobody had time. And it took like three, four months to get it done, you know. Um, but the response has been amazing. And it's funny you say that. Uh, yesterday, I was I was walking down the street, I'm in Brian, and uh, some guy was waving at me out of the car. I was going, what am I mean? He goes, you are my... I went, yeah, you got quite a young guy, like in his 20s. Yeah, I just bought your vinyl, it's amazing. I'm like, oh, wow, thank you. You know, yeah, it's really nice to, to be appreciated like that. I just wish they'd printed more copies. So now we're doing another run. I hope they've done the, the appropriate amount because it, it seems to be... Uh, Selling really well. Okay, we'll have to keep an eye on that because yeah, I wasn't quick enough. They, I mean, they sold out like ridiculous. <laughs> um, we should also talk about live performance then. So we're finally back at it, 2022, and you were live last night in Canary Wharf, weren't you? At the boys, though. Yeah, yeah. I got to give thanks to the boys though because that was a bit of my work that I could do during the lockdown because of that strange ruling about restaurants. It was right to be in a restaurant, but not a club. Yeah, so you could do or, gigs or at like Pizza Express or, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I did um, stuff on the lives where, I'm, you know, it's just me on the keyboard or backing tracks. And that's what I did, basically. But this is a, a new venture that um, myself and Ranald, the guy that owns the the, ven- the venue, his suggestion, actually, that uh, we should do an Omar and Friends night. And it was sold out last night, so which was really good. And it was a little bit worried because the last one I did. It, I was thinking oh, it's going to be a bit weak, but then the you was it the what was the the last football thing we had was it Euros? Oh yeah, yeah, it was the Euros championship. It was the it? Euros. Yeah. No, so it was the, the it was the semi-finals or something that happened to be on that same night. So he stuck them up on all the screens. So I was thinking, ah, oh, maybe that's why they came to the gig. But no, it got sold. It was sold. Out. 
that, that's nice. I had nothing to worry about. Oh, nice. And then, and are you picking the guest vocalists who are joining you? Yeah, it was all like, you know, I know these, I know these guys, why not try and, and get them? You know, Vula was supposed to do the same thing that I was supposed to do with the orchestra, but she, she got COVID. You know what I mean? So that was off. Like, Trevor Nelson got COVID as well. It was that one of those weird ones. So you just trying to get somebody that can do it at the right time and that they're available to make it work. But it was, you know, it was encouraging to see that we sold out. We'll keep doing it and build on it. Vula, you mentioned that Vula Malinga is one of the guest vocalists mm. last night. Also was um, the, one of the singers with Paul on the Barbican kick as well. So there's a right. lovely little well of connection there as well. Connection. Yeah, right. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, and we've also got a... a I mean, hopefully your solo LP this year, fingers crossed you've been talking about, but there's another album that's coming out, which is you with the QCBA. So this yeah. was recorded at the Jazz Cafe last May. This is live at last. And there's going to be an album launch at a gig at the Jazz Cafe in March, I think. Tell me about your work with those guys. I first started working with Quentin Collins. He was playing keyboards for me about 20 years ago. And then 10 years ago, he'd asked me to do, they were like doing some tour of, Italy, which I was like, hell yeah, I'm, 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 I'm up for that. And then from there, we just kind of kept doing shows. I commissioned somebody to film us, like playing at my friend's studio. We put that up. It seems to get a lot of traction out of it because people seem to like those versions of my song they like the, the jazz version you know it's not for the jazz purists I must have you know I've done stuff with Courtney Pine as well when you do those gigs yeah. what's he singing for I, I want to hear singing I just want to hear the sax screaming for 20 minutes uh, <laughs> I mean that's you, know, you get those kind of jazz purists but it's always you know it's, it's fun to try try my stuff in in different ways and it also gives me a bit of a break because because it's jazz everybody gets a solo and they get nice long solos I just have to sing the beginning sing the end and move on to the next tune you know what I mean? So, but yeah, that's coming out soon. You know more than I do. You're constantly being creative, constantly working on stuff, constantly moving forward, which seems to be a, a link that you have in common with Mr. Weller. I mean, you're constantly looking forward, less so, but yeah, looking back, which was what you know, I, I asked about the question about the anthology. Yeah, uh, it's about evolution. Yeah, I still get that, that fire in my belly. I get excited about making music. I get excited about performing it as well I'm not no, I never tire of it as well and these uh, you know like I said I give thanks every day that I can get to create these things I started at a time when you know it wasn't easy for soul musicians and things I've created a, a fantastic catalogue I've worked with fantastic musicians as well and I've got a lot to be thankful for you know what I mean as long as I've got breath in my body and I'm able to do it that's what I'm going to be doing you know what I mean yeah, make no mistake yeah 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 well this has been so lovely I should ask you about the two other tracks that you said that you were creating with Paul how much can you tell us about those two those tracks, yeah, there's one is a definite, I mean, they're, they're all fantastic tunes. There's another one, it's uh, it's got hit written all over it. My brother's girlfriend, Charlene Hamilton, singing on it. Horn arrangements, upbeat, you'll like it. That's all I can say. <laughs> as much as I can give away. <laughs> well, this is the ultimate tease, I have to say, but it's been... Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> as much as I can give you. When you think back to those moments, because you did post on on um, on your Instagram, you said, let me find the actual quote here. So hold on. It was um, February 2021, you post on Instagram, you said, 31 years ago, this dude gave me a chance playing percussion and singing with his band in Japan and the UK. And it was you and Mr. Weller, both of the two yeah. together. Yeah, when you look back at that, I mean, that seems like such a ridiculous length of time, doesn't it? <laughs> to, to Pass by, whole, pass by in an instant, whole, yeah. As a whole grown adult ago, yeah. It, it does. It just feels like, you know, it's gone like that and it's been such a long time. And it's just, I was saying to him the other day, he's like the most humblest superstar that I know. Do you know what I mean? You would just never know that this guy is as huge as he is. But when you're hanging out, he's just like a mate. He likes it. He loves a laugh and a smoke. And you know what I mean? That kind of stuff is just, uh, it's precious. And uh, I don't think he's going to lose that. I, so I just feel honoured, basically. And I, and I owe a lot to him for, you know, where I am now. Because he's part. he's been part of my journey and a, and a proper, you know, a real part of it as well. So both of you started at such a ridiculously young age to me. I can't. I mean, I've got my my eldest is seven years old. So to think in ten years' time he'd be going off to Japan and doing something that terrifying. <laughs> no, you're not going anywhere. What are you on about? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the kind of thing. You know, I saw a, a press piece of me when I was 16 <laughs> and say that this is the, the new prodigy and I was thinking shit I totally forgot about that I mean I remember them asking me if I wanted a record deal at 16 and I said no because I wanted to carry on with my education just in case it didn't work out for me I have no idea why I was saying I should have taken the money <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know that's just how, I mean that's how it's worked out I wouldn't I would change any part of my life for anything, you know, because it's all been part of the journey. It all makes me what I am now and it all helps with what's to come as well. That was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about actually as well. And thinking about it, it's something I'd like to talk to Paul about. How much are you aware of that legacy, that influence that you have 
on others from your music? I've been told this, and yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, I can hear it, and some people go, "Oh, this sounds like an Omar thing." I'm going, "Okay, yeah, I can, I can get it." And you know, I get a lot of love in the states as well. You know, from big artists. I mean, you know, Stevie, you can't really get much bigger than that. I can see it. I'm humbled by it. You know, it's it's nice to know that people know that I exist. Put it that way. I, you know, I'm not there for the glory or anything. I'm just here having a good time, and I hope everybody latches on to the good vibe. And it must be nice also to still be being recognised for that as well. So you mentioned Boysdale, you won Singer Songwriter of the Year last year. It was up yeah, at Jazz yeah. FM, one of my old stomping grounds. I used to work for Bauer Radio, got a nomination there as well. So to still be getting recognised from the, for the work, it must be important too. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not, the, it's not the main reason, you know, but to get those little accolades is great. And to get it from the, from the youngers as well, you know, like I said, this guy in his 20s listening to stuff. I've had kids in 15, 14, they've been listening and to the music as well and like incessantly so to cross the generations like that is, is fantastic it means I'm still current and i still got something to prove still relevant exactly that's what you want that's it, it? Yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. right two final questions before you go Omar this has been so lovely um, you're allowed one no Paul Weller song for the rest of your life <laughs> it can be the jam the style council or solo what's it going to be I say Eaton Rifles oh jam. okay why that yeah, one? That, that's the first one that just came in. That's the one in it. It's the, the rhythm of the track because it's like it's syncopated, it's offbeat. And the other thing as well, it's fucking amazing about them. It's three of them. Yeah. Three of them making all that noise. Yeah, <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. The only other band I could sort of equate to that would be the police. You know what I mean, and they were incidentally a band that, that was my first album that I bought was Regatta de Blanc. So that kind of sound, that kind of punky funky type thing is uh, yeah something so there you go I'm just thinking presumably you must have had a little preview of Fat Pot before it came out because you were at the barn when it was being made weren't you or it was being, when it was being finished off he played me a couple pieces Def- yeah yeah no he did play me a couple pieces and I wrote back to him and said I love Sam Jackson like, fantastic I mean how many albums has he done yeah. how many years has he been going you know what I mean that's the kind of makes minds pay into insignificance. So, yeah, you're uh, very yeah. you're very slow and a procrastinator yeah, in comparison. Exactly, right? exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I need to get my skates on. Right, final question. Um, so the purpose of this podcast is not least to meet amazingly talented, <laughs> lovely people like yourself with connection and support, but it's also for me to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. If it happens, <laughs> what should I ask him? What should you ask him? Oh, no, there's no way I'm going to give you that. That's all <laughs> you, man. That is all you. I mean, if you waited all this time to ask him something, then you really got to think about that yourself. <laughs> I, you know should, I, mean? I should have a question, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you, 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 it sounds like you really do your research. So you know the history, you know all the players, you know all the characters in his life. You know all the songs. You know, you know all the phases that he's been through and everything. So you, now nah, you know more than I do. So you answer that yourself. <laughs> I, t- I tell you what, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to, I'm going to say, what was the bit of advice that you gave Omar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could try that. You could try it, mate. <laughs> but you know, he's quite tight-lipped, so I don't think he's going to come out. Come oh, out with it. <laughs> oh damn it! This has been nice so lovely. Um, good luck with the new album, the Thank live you. album. Good luck with the new solo album. Good luck with the live gigs. Fingers crossed. That's, yeah, I think yeah. we're coming to the end of the madness thank you so much yeah. for your time Omar and all the very best alright Dan thanks a lot no problem take care well there you go my thanks once again to Omar for joining me on the latest episode of the podcast I cannot wait to hear that new material either if you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast please do share on your social media channels it all helps to spread the word you can get in touch on Twitter at WellerFanPod or on Instagram and Facebook Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Now, if you head to my website, not only can you find loads of details about Omar and more about our chat there, but you can also find out more about our upcoming live show and buy tickets on my website. Gary Crowley, Steve Tufty Carver, Talking the Jam, The Star Council, Paul Weller Solo, and much, much more. Get on there. PaulWellerFanPodcast.com is the website. And whilst you're there, you can buy me a virtual coffee if you like as well. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.